Welcome to Book Passage. My name is Melissa Cesaro. Thank you for coming out tonight from far and near. And uh, to support what we do here at Book Passage, which is we're so fortunate to have these wonderful authors and speakers come here and speak in the independent bookstore. So thank you for supporting your independent bookstore. The wonderful, best-selling author, Kelly Corrigan, is here to introduce Jenny Lawson tonight. Mm -hmm. Kelly is the author of three unforgettable memoirs, <coughs> The Middle Place, Lift, and Glitter and Glue. She is also one of the most generous literary citizens about town. Mm -hmm. Every year, she curates this incredible uh, venue called Notes and Words, where she brings musicians, and writers together on stage uh, to support the Children's Hospital of Oakland. She also does these amazing interviews on Medium with writers like Margaret Atwood, B.J. Novak, and Annie Lamont. And after you read Jenny's book tonight, I recommend that you check out every one of these interviews. They're just terrific. So uh, please welcome rock star host and author Kelly Corrigan. <laughs> Everybody. Oh my god, you're in for so much fun. Uh, one is, you got this, this is Notes and Words, April 30th, love to have you. Super cool, I just asked Jenny Lawson if she would read at it, and I think she's sort of thinking about it. So, uh, maybe getting pressure, maybe we could pressure her into it. It's a nice thing to do with somebody who has anxiety issues. <laughs> in San Francisco and it's super duper cool. So if you didn't get one, they're right up here and you can come on up and get more information. Okay, so I have a theory about fiction, as we all do, why we make up stories and why we read made up stories. And I think it's that some things are just too humiliating or gruesome or gnarly or just intimate to say out loud. So we develop characters and settings and situations as cover, basically, for our flaws and fears our most rotten, selfish, illogical selves, so that we can play out scenarios incognito. But then you get someone like Jenny Lawson, <laughs> who has basically set herself free from all stigma, while simultaneously entertaining a vast readership, not to mention thrilling her publisher with back-to-back -back bestsellers, who screams from a vaguely fetal position, I don't want to be a grown-up. I take drugs and I can't handle Girl Scouts or QuickBooks. I have a taxidermy wolf named Wolf Blitzer. I spent a lot of money once on a kangaroo costume. I'm allergic to making sense and defensively stabby and hate mathy stuff and use made up words. I put my cats, Ferris Mueller and Hunter S. Tomcat, in my will. This woman comes along to help us see that a life that's easy might not actually be a life that's better. And to show us that honesty empowers and what makes us different is what makes us interesting. And all of that is why I drove for an hour and foisted myself upon this evening so that I could look at Jenny Lawson and say, thank you and never stop sharing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the phenomenal Jenny Lawson. because I know a lot of you, like me, don't like to leave the house and are thinking, you live very close to me. <laughs> and I escape at any time I want to. And let me tell you, yes, you can, because everyone would understand. Um, and secondly, I wanted to say thank you for the amazing support that you have given this 
strange little book. <laughs> um, I think it's really fantastic if you look at the, the, the bestseller list, you look at it and all the people on it, they have their, their picture on the front and you go like, oh, there's Minnie Kaylee and there's that asshole O'Reilly and there's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all people and you, like, you, look, you look at them and go like, oh yeah, I know that person, I hate that person, I like that person, oh, okay. And then there's a dead raccoon. <laughs> and that's not supposed to be a bestseller, but you guys um, have made it so in that you have been so supportive of it and because you have shared it with so many other people. What I think is so fantastic, so often people will come up um, during readings and they'll say, I have no idea who you are, I think you have a blog, maybe you have another <coughs> book before, I don't know. Um, but my uh, friend gave me this book and said, I understand you now. Or they, they said, you know, oh, finally, something that I can give to my mother to say, look, I'm not alone. <laughs> it's okay to be weird. It's okay to be strange. Um, and that is such a wonderful thing. And I've had so many people come and say how incredibly happy that they are that they've been able to find this amazing community. And they've been able to find it because of you guys. So thank you for that. I'm going to read two chapters. One that's normal size and one that's like a page and I will just basically read it all in one breath and then it'll pass out. Um, so the first one that I'm going to read is furiously happy, dangerously sad. You're not crazy. Stop calling yourself crazy, my mom says for the 11 billionth time. You're just, you're sensitive and a little odd. <laughs> and fucked up enough to require an ass load of meds, I add. That's not crazy, my mom says as she turns back to scrubbing the dishes. You're not crazy and you need to stop saying that you are. It makes you sound like a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> and I laugh because this is a familiar argument. It's the same one that we have had a million times before and the same one that we will have a million times again. So I let it lie. And besides, technically she is right. I'm not technically crazy. But Crazy is a much simpler way of labeling what I really am. According to the many shrinks that I've seen in the last few decades, I am a high-functioning depressive with severe anxiety disorder, moderate clinical depression, and mild self-harm issues that stem from an impulse control disorder. I have avoidance personality disorder, which is like social anxiety disorder on speed, and occasional depersonalization disorder, which makes me feel utterly detached from reality, but in less of a, this LSD is awesome kind of way, and more of a, I wonder what my face is doing right now, sort of way, or it sure would be nice to feel emotions again kind of way. I have rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune issues, and sprinkled in like paprika over a mentally unbalanced deviled egg are things like mild OCD and trichotillomania, the urge to pull one's hair out, which is always nice to end on because whenever people hear the word mania, they automatically back off and give you more room on crowded airplanes. <laughs> Probably because you're not supposed to talk about having manias while you're on a crowded airplane. This is one of the reasons why my husband Victor hates to fly with me. The other reason is I often fly with taxidermied creatures as anxiety service animals. <laughs> Basically, we don't travel a lot together because he doesn't understand awesomeness. <laughs> you are not a maniac, my mom says in an aggravated voice. You just like to pull your hair. You even did it when you were little. It's just, it's soothing to you. It's like, it's like petting a kitten. Mm -hmm. I like to pull my hair out, I clarify, <laughs> and it's sort of different, and that's why they call it a mania and not a kitten petting disorder. <laughs> Which honestly would suck to have because then you'd end up with a bunch of semi bald kittens who would really hate you. <laughs> My god, I hope I never get overly, enth overly enthusiastic kitten fur pulling disorder. <laughs> My mother sighs deeply, but this is exactly why I love having these conversations with her. Because she gives me perspective. It's also why she hates having these conversations with me, because I give her details. <laughs> you are perfectly normal, my mom says, shaking her head as if even her body won't let her get away with this sort of lie. <laughs> I laugh as I tug involuntarily at my hair. I have never been normal, and I think we both know that. My mom pauses for a moment, trying to think up another line of defense, but it is pretty hopeless. I've always been naturally anxious to ridiculous degrees. 
My early school memory is of a field trip to a hospital when a doctor pulled out some blood samples, and I immediately passed out right into a wall of, thankfully, empty bedpans. <laughs> According to the other kids present, a teacher said, ignore her, she just wants attention. Sadly, <laughs> my head started bleeding, and the doctor cracked open an ammonia capsule under my nose, which is a lot like being punched in the nose by an invisible fist of stink. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't even know why I had passed out. My baseline of anxiety remained the same, but my subconscious was apparently so terrified that it decided the safest place for me to be would be fast asleep on the floor surrounded by bedpans, <laughs> which sort of shows why my body is an idiot. <laughs> because worse narcolepsy is pretty much the worst defense ever. <laughs> it's like the human version of playing possum, which is only helpful if bears are trying to eat you, because apparently if you lie down in front of bears, they're all, what a badass, I attack her and she takes a cat nap, but I probably shouldn't fuck with her. <laughs> start of a long and ridiculous period of my life, which shrinks label white coat syndrome. <coughs> my family refers to it as what the hell is wrong with Jenny syndrome, and I think my family was more accurate in their assessment, because passing out when you see doctor's coats is just damn ridiculous and more than slightly embarrassing, especially later when you have to say, sorry I passed out on you, apparently I'm afraid of coats. <laughs> <laughs> to make things even worse, when I pass out, I tend to flail about on the floor, and apparently I moan, go <laughs> like a Frankenstein, according to my mother, who has witnessed this on several occasions. Other people might battle a subconscious fear of adversity or failure or being stoned to death, but my hidden phobia makes me faint at the sight of outerwear. <laughs> I passed out once at the optometrist, twice at the dentist office, and two horrifying times at the gynecologist. <laughs> yeah, the nice thing about passing out at the gynecologist, though, is that if you're already in the stirrups, you don't have very far to fall. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're like me and you flail about wildly or you're, while you're moaning and unconscious. <laughs> it's pretty much the worst way to pass out with someone inside your vagina. It's <laughs> like so having a really unattractive orgasm if you're not even awake for it. <laughs> First, first way to wake up is to find bears eating you because your body thought its safest defense was to go to sleep in front of bears. <laughs> that playing possum bullshit almost never works. Not that I would know because I would never pass out in front of bears because that would be ridiculous. And in fact, I have been known to run at bears in order to get good pictures of them. <laughs> Instead, I pass out in front of coats, which according to my brain are the things you really need to be concerned about. <laughs> One time I loudly lost consciousness at my veterinarian's office when he called my name. Apparently, my subconscious freaked out when I saw blood on the vet's coat, and I abruptly passed out right on my cat. That's not a euphemism. I woke up shirtless in the lobby with a bunch of strangers and dogs looking down on me. Evidently, when I started moaning, the vet called the ambulance, and then when the EMTs arrived, they claimed they couldn't find my heartbeat, and so they ripped open my shirt. Personally, I think they just wanted a cheap thrill. I think the dogs looking down at me agreed, as they seemed slightly embarrassed for me after watching the whole spectacle unfold. But you really can't blame dogs, because first of all, who would look away from a train wreck like that? Secondly, dogs have no concept of modesty. <laughs> Waking up shirtless with a bunch of concerned dogs staring at your dog because you're afraid of coats is about the seventh worst way to wake up. I mutter aloud to my mother. Hmm. My mom says, non-committally, raising a single eyebrow. Well, okay, maybe you're not normal, normal, she says grudgingly, but who wants to be normal? You are fine, you are perfectly fine, you are better than normal even because you are so aware of what's wrong with you that you can recognize it and sort of fix it. <laughs> and I nod because she does have a point, although the rest of the world might disagree with our definition of fixing it. When I was little, I fixed it by hiding from the world in my empty toy box whenever my undiagnosed anxiety got too unbearable. In high school, I fixed it by isolating myself from other people. In college, I fixed it with eating disorders, controlling what I ate to compensate for the lack of control that I felt with my emotions. 
And now, as an adult, I control it with medication, adding strength visits and behavioral therapy. I control it by being painfully honest about just how crazy I am. I control it by allowing myself to hide in bathrooms and under tables during important events. And sometimes, sometimes I control it by letting it control me because I have no other choice. Sometimes I am unable to get out of bed for a week at a time and anxiety attacks are still an uncomfortable and terrifying part of my life. But after my furiously happy epiphany, I have learned the importance of pushing through, knowing that one day soon I will be happy again. This is why I sneak into other people's bathrooms and haunted hotels and once accepted a job as a political czar who reports directly to the stray cat that sleeps at City Hall. <laughs> I have staged live zombie apocalypse drills in crowded ballrooms. I have landed on aircraft carriers at sea. I once crowdfunded enough money to buy a taxidermy Pegasus. <laughs> I am furiously happy, and it's not a cure for mental illness. It's a weapon designed to counter it. It's a way to take back some of the joy that's robbed from you when you're crazy. Ah, you're not crazy, my mom said again, <laughs> waving a wet plate at me. Stop saying you're crazy. People will think you're a lunatic. <laughs> and it's true, they will. I Google the word lunatic and read her one of the definitions. Lunatic, noun, wildly or giddily foolish. My mom pauses and stares at me and finally sighs in resignation, recognizing way too much of me in that definition. Yeah. Hmm, she says, shrugging thoughtfully as she turns back to the sink. So maybe crazy isn't so bad after all. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Sometimes crazy is just right. Mm -hmm. I have found a kindred soul, and he has a very healthy coat. A few weeks ago, I was at the pharmacy picking up my meds, and I was staring into the drive through window and thinking about how awesome it is that we live in a world where you can pick up drugs in a drive through <laughs> And that's when I noticed something strange next to the pharmacist register. I don't know if you can see this, but this is an open box of milk bone dog biscuits <laughs> next to the register. And I thought, well, that's odd, but maybe someone returned them because they were stale or something, and then I thought it was even odder that someone could realize that dog biscuits had gone stale, yeah. <laughs> because dogs usually aren't very good at not eating cookies, even if they're fairly shitty. Dogs will eat used diapers if you let them, so I'm pretty sure none of them are saying no to cookies. But then the pharmacist came back, and while he was bringing me up, he reached over and picked up a handful of broken dog biscuits and ate them. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, wait. <laughs> Am I high right now? <laughs> Is he high? Am I being tested? Should I say something? But I didn't, because I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to accuse the man giving you drugs of eating dog food. <laughs> and then I signed for my drugs and I drove away and I thought to myself, Is it possible that he accidentally ate the dog biscuits? <laughs> or maybe someone at work is always stealing his food, so he decided to put his tasty unit cookies made for humans, not out of humans, <laughs> into a milk bone box to keep them safe. Or maybe he just likes to entertain himself. If seeing, if strangers will say, hey dude, you're eating dog food. <laughs> those would be good people, probably. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> but then I spent the whole day thinking, why the dog biscuits? And so I went back today to ask, but the dog biscuits were gone, and the dog biscuit, dog biscuit eating guy was also gone. And I thought, can I ask this pharmacist if the other pharmacist who eats dog food is around because I really need to know the story? And the answer is no. No, I can't. <laughs> I really want to know because I suspect that I would be great friends with this guy because anyone who would hide crackers in a dog food box seems like someone I'd want to hang out with. Although someone who just eats dog food for fun seems slightly more questionable. Except now I'm wondering if maybe milk bones are really delicious and he's just a genius who's discovered really cheap cookies. <laughs> cookies you don't have to call your judgmental vet about when your dog is in the pantry and eats all of them. You do still have to call the vet though when your cat has eaten a toy that consists of a tinkle bell and a feather and a poof ball all tied together with twine. This actually happened to me once and it was the worst because the vet told me that I would have to ply the cat with laxatives in order to make sure the toy would pass 
smoothly through and then inspect the poop to make sure that the joint had passed because otherwise they would have to do open cat surgery. And then it did finally start to pass, but just the first part with the tingle bell. And the cat was freaked out because he was running away from the tingle bell, which was hanging out of his butthole. And what I called him he said, definitely not pull on the joint because it could pull out his intestines, which would be the grossest pinata ever. And so I just ran after the cat with some scissors to cut off the tingle which impressively was still tinkling after saying things. Tinkle Bell should ever have to see. And probably the cat was running away both because of the Tinkle Bell and because I was chasing it with sharp scissors. Sorry, let me help you. All of his good friends, rat dog, food eating pharmacist, I would call to tell him about the Tinkle Bell issue because I really appreciated it. But I never found it again because I was worried that if I ever asked to see the dog food eating pharmacist, the other pharmacist would stop giving me drugs. <laughs> this all feels a bit discriminatory, but I can't explain exactly why. <laughs> very lucky because a lot of people don't get to do tours and so I'm really lucky that first of all the bookstores are like yes please come and that people show up mm -hmm. and so I, I actually even though speaking is really difficult it's such a it's such an honor to be able to, to do it so I just basically look at the list and I'm like okay but I really Honestly, like if you ask me right now what city I was in, I would say, I have no idea. I think this was still in Chicago. I think. <laughs> um, and it, it actually is it the only reason that I know that I'm in California is because my sister is here and she lives in California. And she was like, I'll stay here as long as you're in California. So that's, that's how I know it. California. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I love all the dialogues with Victor when you go back and forth. Do y'all ever sit in the office or in bed or whatever and read it back and forth and just laugh at how you know ridiculous sometimes it is and just how funny? You have the best word to say. Oh my gosh, that would be a dream marriage. <laughs> 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 I, the, the question is, do you ever like, you know, sit in bed and just like reread it and laugh together? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. Um, but first of all, Victor does it like in our relationship, and I and everybody who knows us knows this. He's way funnier than me in real life, but he's not funny on paper. And so whenever, so so he doesn't get to read the book until it's done because he, what he does is he'll look at something and he'll be like. Yeah, like, okay, no, yeah, it's fine, that's no, fine. And then, that, and then for me, that's like a, the worst thing you could possibly say. Uh, so he doesn't really get to see very much of it. And even the stuff that I put on the blog, um, I don't uh, usually, he doesn't really know kind of what's going on because he's kind of busy with his own stuff. And it's interesting because he'll be like on a conference call and they'll be like, dude, that was so funny, the thing about the blah, 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 blah. You know, it is a bobcat. And, and he'll be like, what? How do people know that they're what? Oh, Jesus, it's on the blog, what did she say? <laughs> um, he has uh, started to, kind of little bit of an appreciation for it though so so that is nice and, and every once in a while he'll say something like you should put that on the blog and it's always something that I'm like no that is not <laughs> nice <laughs> and instead I like stop him like in the middle of an argument I'm like hold on because I'm writing this shit down which is <laughs> <laughs> fantastic because all of a sudden then he's like on his best behavior <laughs> and I just like turn on the recorder and I'm like no 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 keep going keep going what else do you want to say um, I, I do actually have um, rules though uh, about what I write. Um, everything, so everything that I write uh, goes out to all the people who are, you know, in the book or in the blogger, um, and they basically get the 
right of first refusal, sort of. So before it even goes to a publisher, they get to look at it and I just say, if there's anything you want me to take out, I will take it out, no questions asked. You don't have to give me a reason why, just tell me. Um, and to their great credit, nobody has ever said, no, take that out. And instead, they're the first ones who say, um, you know what, I have pictures of the pet raccoon that used to live in our house that we made jams for. Do you need a picture of that? And like, yeah, I need a picture of that. Nobody leaves me. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, what's also like wonderful about that is, um, like, especially when I was writing the first book and I kind of struggled with like, well, what are the stories that I tell and which ones are the ones that I don't? And, and my sister was like, I can't believe you didn't tell the story of like, Jenkins are turkey and I was like Jenkins why like why would I tell that story and she and I started thinking about it and I'm like oh that is a weird story I guess not everybody does have horrible attack turkeys who you know probably is full of shit everywhere in your life and, 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 and those chapters end up in there and but you're, you're so like invested in yourself that you're like oh that's all normal because you don't realize um, when it comes to Victor, uh, I never write about something that we are currently still arguing about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have made that mistake before, and it's not, it's not entirely fair because I basically have like the internet on my side, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is why if you go to there's actually several websites, and they're called like Is Victor Wrong? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of them. Um, but but at the same time, there's also a lot of people who are like Team Victor. You're crazy. That man's a saint. So um, it, it keeps us together. So it's a good thing. Um, the other thing is I try never to write anything that is where I'm, like, I have to be the biggest butt of the joke. It's okay if I'm making fun of other people as long as I'm making fun of me way more. Um, and then the, my final thing is, is I try to never write anything that I think a mean 14-year-old girl can use against my daughter one day, <laughs> which is pretty much everything, um, which is why she's not in it as much. Um, but, uh, yeah, so those are... That's probably not the answer. I should have been like, yes, we stumble at night and we cuddle. <laughs> and I read and he goes, you're so darling. And then I'm like, did you bring my hair? And he's like, oh, I was waiting for you to ask. <laughs> the bobcat ever come back? The bobcat does not come back, um, <laughs> but there are several stray cats who are hanging out in the backyard, and I think they're just hiding. Uh, and, <laughs> and so I was like, what are we going to do? We, I actually, um, for those of you who missed it, there was this. Uh, I, I went outside. I was taking Dorothy Barker, my dog, and she's like, this tiny little puppy on it. It was like 6 o'clock in the morning. She's like, I'm going to the bathroom. I'm like, oh, I don't even want to put on pajamas, so... I just basically walked out in like a half a rope and, and I'm walking out and I see this cat running at me and I'm like, ah, oh, that cat's huge. Why are they feeding that cat? Oh my God, it's a bobcat. And I'm like, I grabbed, I grabbed Donnie and I like, ran back inside and I was like, oh my God, nobody's going to believe this. And so I got Victor and Haley and they came down and they were like, oh, I'm sorry, you drunk. I see what I am. What are you doing? And, um, and, the, and this bobcat is like right up on the, like sitting on the porch just kind of looking up like, I came to get loving. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> loving, loving. I mean, to the point where, like, stay for hours and will, like, put his, put his her head, or, or, I don't know, probably his, his head, like, up to the, the window and just kind of rub against it. And, like, and every time I open the door a little bit, it would, like, run up to the door and I'd be like, oh, you can't come in, but I kind of want to touch you by right now. <laughs> and, and so when I put on the, on the uh, picture on the internet, I was like, there's a Bobcat outside my house, but it wants to come in, and I'm, what do I do? Do I snuggle with it? It seems like it wants snuggles, but also I like my hands, and I don't know. And, um, and what was fascinating is, first of all, like almost everybody immediately was like, Yes, of course, that's a bobcat. That is a classic bobcat. That's everything about that is bobcat. And then, but then there was like 1% who were like, oh no, that's a F1 Savannah Bengal blah blah blah. It's worth twenty thousand dollars and you better go pick it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> and they were serious. And and I just I had this 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 thought in my head of me like picking up this vodka and just being mauled to death and being like, I got your kitty <laughs> left, but we have now a live trap so that if it comes back, we can get it and take it to your rehab place, because I think it's probably someone's domestic cat who, ugh, oh, 
people. <laughs> oh, at the same time, like my dad does that too, so I can't really complain too much. <laughs> we made him release his. So. <laughs> Maybe that's the one. Oh, I kid head. you not. An hour before I drove up here, my son told me almost the exact same story. Uh, although they he was at my house, but he didn't have <laughs> 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 They did find it was somebody who owned it, but it was a freaking big cat that came to his work and he was talking about it like, I wanted to pick it up, but I didn't want to get mauled. I'm like, well, I've heard this before. <laughs> yeah, but that, though, is like the perfect metaphor for life. I wanted to pick it up, but I didn't want to get mauled. <laughs> That's my whole life. Right? Um, and, and, but usually in the end, I do end up picking it up. And <laughs> if it comes back. I will be, I actually have like welding gloves now, so I'm not wearing them. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and I, uh, Victor has a stormtrooper outfit, so I was like, that and it covers like everything. And, but then I was a little, I thought like, if it attacks me, I won't be able to tell like, is it attacking me because it's a bucket or is it attacking me because it doesn't like stormtroopers? <laughs> so, because that seems terrifying. Um, I forgot what the question was. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm not taking my ADD medication today. So. <laughs> Next okay. question. Yeah. Uh, um, so, Victor doesn't get to read the book till the end. Do, do you let Haley read your blog and your book and everything? Good question. Um, <laughs> Haley definitely does not read the blog. Uh, there's way too much, uh, there's, there's too much profanity in it, even though. <laughs> I'm a big fan of letting kids listen to cursing because I think you need to be able to learn how to curse beautifully, um, and you shouldn't just be sloppy about it. So, so, in, so in some ways, I'm like, you know what, it's okay, a little bit, but at the same time, um, there's some stuff that I'm like. Oh, you're gonna take that to school and tell everybody, and I'm gonna be like even worse than the mother because already her teachers are reading the blog and are like, we should have her removed. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, she, uh, I did read her quite a bit of the book, but it was like me reading it to her so that I could like be like, and we're gonna skip that part. Again. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Okay, now I got it again. Okay. Um, so, so there is that, and anything that where she's in it, I read it to her first. And there are actually some really, really funny stories that are fantastic. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such a great story. She's like, mm, I don't want you to, I don't want you to share it. And so I haven't. So I have them like in, in, in another like little journal, so that when she's 18, I can be like, no, I can write it. She'll be like, fuck you, I'm writing my own book. <laughs> 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 But there, are, there actually are there are kids in her class that read it, which is sort of weird. They're like, I read your mom's book, and, and they'll just, she'll come home and she'll be like, so all these other kids get to read my book, and I'm like, are they leaving one star reviews on Amazon? And no, they are. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, she's 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 getting a little bit more and a little more, and she actually has gone to a couple of readings, so she's she's heard a little more, and she knows. Possibly a little more than I would like, but that's <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you, you mentioned Dorothy Parker in your book, yeah. and you named your dog after Dorothy Parker. Is she a, 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 spe a special <coughs> favorite author of yours, or what's your relationship? I think she is so fantastic. I discovered her when I was very young, probably way too young to be reading her, um, and and I just I love the idea. Um, and and I, I like her stories and Big Blonde and like like that's, and that's all good. But I love her poetry, which I'm sure if she was here, she would be like, that's not what I want to be remembered for. But if you have not had the opportunity to go look up Dorothy Parker's poetry, because it is beautiful and insightful and just filled with the most irreverent <coughs> horror, where you're just like, and, you, and you're and you're like, oh, this is so lovely, this is so lovely, and then she just ends with this. A cervic wit, and you're just like fucking a yes, yes, <laughs> and, and not only that, but she did it, you know, like back in the '30s when, when it was not particularly easy. And I just, I'm a big fan. Yes, yes. Have you read the book where Dorothy Parker is a is a ghost at <laughs> whatever hotel that the she used? Yeah, there's a there's a novel where the 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 book has to be open, the guest book has to be open, and she comes. 
and she's part of the story. I have not oh, read that. Of um, course, I can remember the title, but I'll find it. I'll find it. It can't be that many George Parker books. Exactly. <laughs> I, I actually was at the Algonquin when I was doing the book tour, and there's this cat, they have like a resident cat that lives there. And um, I looked at everywhere for that damn cat. Like, I was just up and down the halls, and I was like, hey, kitty, kitty. And everybody was like, did you lose your cat? And I'm like, it's not my cat. I don't know what it looks like. I don't find it. <laughs> was ridiculous and then finally like at the very end like security came and knocked on the door and they were like the cat's downstairs <laughs> I know where it is it's in a corner I know you've been looking for it and I was like oh that's really embarrassing but yes I made your kitty <laughs> <laughs> and so I sat there and drank cocktails with this cat by myself and it was wonderful <laughs> I was like this right here like it was almost like I was with Dorothy Parker <laughs> and she was in a cat <laughs> <laughs> There's two, it's a dogs. series. I oh, it's a series. Up. Yeah, it's Farewell Dorothy Parker and Dorothy Parker Drank Here. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Those are going over. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to have a silly introduction to a serious question, which is, when I started reading your blog, I described it to my husband as like, there's this really great woman and she has like these, she has these insanely exaggerated conversations with her husband. And then I saw a video and realized it was an exact transcription. <laughs> <laughs> and then I read your first book, and I kept my husband awake because the vibr mattress was <laughs> fucking. <laughs> <laughs> because of the vibrator? <laughs> <laughs> I do understand no, that. <laughs> <laughs> I do understand that. Yeah. 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 But I got to the point, and you were talking about sort of the whole package of your childhood, and the gift of it and the non-gift of it and you said at the time one of the things in that list was being poor and not having money for therapy for your anxiety disorder and at the time my daughter was having really bad anxiety attacks and I still wonder were you serious or not? Um, oh yeah absolutely I, I was um, I had anxiety disorder I mean, the, my earliest memories. Were you serious that you were glad that you didn't have therapy? Oh, that I kids? didn't have therapy at the time. Yeah, yeah, and, um, and and I I answer that with with like a, an enormous star beside it because um, if my daughter came to me and she was having the same panic attacks that I was having at that age, without a doubt, I would absolutely say. We'll take you to therapy, and we'll get you. There's there's behavioral therapy. There's cognitive therapy. There's so many great things out there, and if none of that works, guess what? There's medication that works. It's gonna be okay. I absolutely would, but I would never have had the life that I had had I not struggled to find a way to work my life around my head, um, and there can be such great benefits to being touched. That's what my grandmother always used to say. You're just a little touched. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and, and I think I think there's lots of them. I think um, one people with high anxiety tend to be very empathetic. Um, it's very easy for us to put ourselves in other people's places because we felt every horrible thing possible and in our heads every horrible thing that could ever possibly happen has already happened mm -hmm. and so it's very easy to think that everybody in here is fighting their own battle um so so there's that um the same thing really with depression somebody asked me recently uh, if you could like you know turn a switch and make it go off forever what would you do and um when I'm actually like deep in a full depressive episode, I think at, at any point during that time I would say yes, but when I'm outside of the depression and it's not lying to me, I can look at it and say, it does make me a better person um, because it makes me who I am and it makes me unique in a special way. And actually my therapist, because I've been on more than six different antidepressants, and after you've been on, after you, it's basically like you fail at that antidepressant. Like it works for a while, and then it just stops working, and you switch to something. And like once you've gone through, I think six, um, your or my insurance pays for 
it's not quite it electroshock therapy, but it's like a, it's like a sweeter version of it, but it's like with like magnets and you sit in this chair for like six weeks and they, and I don't really understand it, but, but she's like, we can totally, you qualify for this now. And she said, and then like, you know, 60% of the cases, it, it completely can cure your depression because it changes your actual brain waves. And, and I really went back and forth with, you know, should I do that? Should I not? And I decided, I like me, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I hate depression, and when I'm in it, I constantly have to remind myself, depression lies, it is not true, those voices in my head are not true, um, but it makes me who I am, and it makes me uh, unique, and I think that so often, uh, being able to feel the, the depths of emotion, whether it's you know the lowest of the lows, can give you the opportunity to feel highs that maybe maybe a normal person wouldn't normally feel. And it can also push you to do things that you wouldn't normally do, like this. Um, because speaking in public uh, is, is terrifying. But then I come out and I look out in the audience and I see people who look more scared than I am. <laughs> and I think, oh, I'm home. And I know like at any moment I could say, I'm freaking out, and I can hide in this little podium, and you guys would just like roll medicine to me, and it would be lovely, and you would talk amongst yourselves, and it would be <coughs> fantastic and wonderful, and I would never have that opportunity if I didn't push myself when I'm out of the hole to do those things, so. Oh, in the back. Hello. Hello. Good question. Um, I think when it comes to media's portrayal of mental illness, there haven't been a whole lot of things that I've seen that have really grabbed me and made me say, oh my god, that. Um, there have been some writers who absolutely have. Um, Ali Brosh, her take on depression, she does hyperbole and half, and she's fantastic and amazing and wonderful. And um, they, I have heard, and I haven't watched it yet, so no spoilers, but I've heard season two of You're the Worst does a really great job of sort of uh, talking about mental illness, and I've only seen season one, and I'm afraid if I watch season two, it might have some triggers, so I'm like, I'm gonna wait until I'm completely mm. out and back home before I watch it, but it's really good, so you should watch it. Or watch season one, I don't know season two. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to like news media and all of that, I try to, Obviously, I try to avoid it um, because it's really, it's negative and it's scary and it's it's so often um, people will you know use the word mental ill to mean bad basically and that um, I, I think a lot of the time and, and I'm trying to think of the best way to say this but uh, you know I have people who will say things like, uh, I really don't know the, way, the, the right way to say it. Um, <coughs> people who will come out and say, just want you to know I'm not crazy, I would never do these crazy things. And they talk about things that happen, like terrible things that people do. And they basically say like, if you're mentally ill, you're the kind of person who could do terrible things. And that's, absolutely not true because there's people who are mentally ill who do amazing, wonderful, fantastic things. And really, one in four of us is going to deal with mental illness ourselves, so if you're not currently, you might in the future and definitely at one point or in time you are going to love someone who's dealing with mental illness, which I think in some ways can be so much harder than having um, to deal with it yourself because of that, that hopeless feeling of, I wanna help that person, but I don't know how to. Um, sorry, I got kind of off track. That was a really deep question, my God. <laughs> yeah. Jenny, do you wanna do one or two more questions? And so okay. we have time to sign books. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so I have a question about um, the How do you do it when you're in it? Like, 
That is, that is a really good question. Um, how do you do it when, you, when you're in it? How do you just get up? Uh, somebody actually on Twitter just this morning said, what do you do on the days when you have no spoons? When you wake up and you have no spoons? And I say, um, if I'm very lucky, I'm home, and I tell myself it's gonna be okay, and that it's all right to sit in bed and watch Doctor Who with my daughter all day long until I come back to me. Um, I, when it comes to depression, it comes and goes, and when I have it, it it's clinical, it's chemistry, it has nothing, there's, there's nothing that happened to me that made me who I am. My sister and I were raised exactly the same way. She has none of the stuff that I have, and she's super outgoing. Um, and my daughter, who I was afraid would pick up on all of my issues, is exactly like my sister, even though we were raised <laughs> states apart. And her kids, some of them are a lot more like me. So it really, it's, it really is kind of, you know, the, the luck of the draw of every single person is different. Um, I've had to work a lot on, uh, <coughs> with my anxiety because my anxiety never goes away. It's, it's always 100% there and sometimes it's to the point where I'm incapacitated and sometimes it's to the point where I can still work and, and do things. Um, but what I've learned is that in, in the time that I've been doing book signings, I've learned that I can't, um, well it's really obvious I've not taken my ADD drugs. Um, I cannot, <laughs> go to lots of different things and then still have the energy and capacity to deal with book signings. So whenever I'm out on tour, I always, I'm always like, oh my gosh, like this person lives here and I love that person, I should go see that person. And there's this and there's that, and I know I can't do it because I know if I do, I'm not gonna have the energy to be able to do a book signing. Um, one of my favorite examples is when I was in New York doing um, this last book signing, I, they put me in this hotel and I looked out and you could see Radio City Music Hall and Carnegie Hall and all these places that like you see on TV and then you're like, oh, they're real, what? Uh, and, and I looked down and I was like, I should totally get, I mean, they're right there. I just, I just need to get out in my hotel room and just walk over there just to say that I did. I should totally do this. And, and I couldn't. Um, literally could not make myself get up off of the floor where I was looking down on the street and seeing these people walking by and it looked so easy for them and I was just like, what is wrong with me? Um, and as I was looking down, there was this fountain that's uh, right in front of Carnegie Hall and it looks like a big, I don't know the name of it, but it looks like a big dandelion and each one of the dandelion things puts off like a spray. And as I'm looking down and watching these people, <coughs> the wind picks up and it picks up the mist from the fountain and the light, the sunlight hits the mist and it hits it in such a way that it creates this prism. And all of a sudden there is this rainbow that is coming from the fountain and is getting picked up by the wind and basically made a flaming rainbow, which it was the most beautiful and amazing thing that I had ever seen. I immediately grabbed my phone and I took a picture because I was like, I've got to share this with my daughter. I can't, like, this is so amazing. I've never seen anything like this, a rainbow flame. And I looked down and I noticed that no one walking by noticed it. And, um, and, and I watched and I, I thought, is it because they're so used to seeing it that it just becomes you know, second nature to them, or they just are used to not looking. And then I realized that it wasn't that, that it was the fact that I was on the 14th floor, and I was so high that I was the only one that had that particular perspective, to have the sun come in from that level, and the water, and the mist rising, and that no one else could see that. And that, that was one of the most amazing moments and one of the greatest gifts that the universe has ever given me, and I would never have seen it if I was out there on the street, which is what every normal person would have been doing. So sometimes your flaws in your life lead you to wonderful moments that you would never find, and sometimes you just have to trust, even though that path is so hard, you just have to trust that 
it's all happening for a reason. Or if it's not, you're going to say it isn't yet. Do <laughs> 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 we have time for one more question? <clears throat> if you have one. Have you met? Uh, well, I just have a comment, and I think, you know, um, I, I believe what you said about one in four people has some mental issue, and I have someone very close to me who does, and he's just magical. I mean, he has really, really hard times, but he's also pure magic, and I think that brings a lot of richness to all of us, this variation in what people have, and I'm grateful that you shed light on it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, that's so kind. And, you know, like honestly, so many of my absolute heroes have the same thing, and it's, it's always a shock to me when I did the... Um, uh, you know, you're supposed to do a book trailer when your book comes out, and I was like, I don't really want to do a book trailer, and so I was like, let's just do this thing where people can hold up a sign, and it just says, I'm broken because, and then they flip it over, and it says, but I'm furiously happy because, and I just went out on Facebook, and I was like, do you guys want to do this? This is what it's, you know, kind of going to happen, and um, not only did I have thousands and thousands of people who did how to do it, and had, like, amazing, wonderful stories, um, but it, it wasn't it wasn't just people like us. It was people who would reach out and they were like amazing, wonderful artists or actors or actresses or writers and, and none of them are accredited in the thing. It's so funny how people later will be like, Did you see that Pat Rothfuss wrote that? And then everybody else will be like, Pat who? What? <laughs> and then somebody else will be, No, but I saw Felicia Day and they're like, Felicia what? And um, and, it, and it's so it's so interesting how there's that that weird sort of crossover and you start to think because like for me Pat Rothfuss is just he's a genius and if you've not read his work he's so fantastic and amazing and suffers from the worst imposter syndrome like possibly even more than me and I always think that there's no way it could get any worse than mine because I'm constantly thinking at any moment people are going to think oh she's really not that funny she's really not that interesting and and that that never goes away um and so Pat when he said you know I want to be uh involved in this he uh, held up his sign and I didn't know what it was going to be until the video came out and it said um, I'm broken because I feel like a failure every day mm -hmm. and then he turned it over and he said but I'm furiously happy because sometimes I put together five perfect words mm -hmm. and, um, and I thought that was so fantastic because not only is it so interesting that we all struggle with that but at the same time that he can be happy about the five perfect words. And it's so easy for us to, to say like, but I didn't write the 22 pages that are due and I didn't you know, go to the bank in time and I didn't do this and I didn't do that. But instead to look and say, but you know what? I did one thing perfectly. Even if it was just to say hi to somebody who needed it or you know, to give somebody a hug or to you know, write a word out on the mirror that somebody else needs to see. Um, we all sort of touch each other in a way that I think we really have no idea about. So, so thank you for touching me, but in a good way. <laughs> in a consensual way. Um, oh, so two things. First is, I want to take a picture of you guys. <laughs> and the second is, while I'm getting my picture ready, um, the second is, I have never made it through a book signing myself. Like the, I mean, I'll make it through this. But I, I've never made it through, like when I'm in the line to have other people sign my book. I can't do it. I've never, ever made it through. Um, and so if you have the same issues that I have, that is completely okay. And let me just say, you win just by being here. The fact that you are here, you win. Um, and if at any point you're like, I really can't do this. All you have to do is take your book to somebody who works here and just say, can you help her sign this and make it out to me? And you can pick it up tomorrow. And that totally works. And you're exactly like me. <laughs> I, was, I wanted to go to um, uh, David Steris. I went to his uh, book signing. <laughs> and, I, and he was so, he was so funny. And he was fantastic. And I got really close. And then I was like, no, can't do it. And, <laughs> and I felt like this, I just like such a loser. And then, um, 
one of my friends, uh, Dylan Birdie, was opening for him, which I guess like once you like become a really good author, you have people open for you, which is <laughs> kind of awesome. Um, so he was opening for him, and he was and, and he was like, you know what, I'll get, I'll, I'll have David sign a book to you, and I was like, that's so awesome. And so he sent it to me, and it said, Dear Jenny, any friend of Dylan's is a whore, and I was like. <laughs>